Okay, so hello everyone, let's get started. Um, so this class, we're going to talk about the uh, BOC incineration, basically to try to finish up on, uh, from our last class, and also talk a little bit about the VOC absorption, which is another method that we can control the VOC emission. Um, so let's do a quick recap um, of our last class. So last class, we basically went through all the methods um, in brief, right? Um, which are which can be used for VOC control. And they include condensation method, right? We said that that's a passive method. We can do absorption, which is drawing the VOC into the bulk of the liquid. Adsorption, which is basically um, attaching these VOC molecules onto the surface of some solid. We can also do combustion because after all the VOC is just made of uh, hydrocarbon, some oxygen, nitrogen, or sulfur. So theoretically, we could uh, just um, let them get oxidized, go through the incineration process. And we could also use the catalytic reaction, which generally happens at a lower temperature. We said that the catalytic reaction basically doesn't change what's happening through the combustion. It's just lowering the temperature so that we don't have a high energy barrier for the, particle, uh, for the VOCs to react. In terms of the combustion and catalytic reaction, we have the direct thermal oxidation and catalytic oxidation. Uh, well, the direct thermal oxidation basically is the process of hydrocarbons reacting with oxygen without any uh, catalyst, right? And because of that, we generally need to burn off the VOC at a relatively higher temperature. And for the catalytic oxidation, they will happen at a lower temperature. And uh, here we'll just focus on the direct thermal oxidation. And uh, one thing for the VOC control of using this method is trying to design or trying to find what is the optimal temperature for us to conduct these thermal oxidation or the incineration process. Um, so regarding this optimal temperature, uh, there are three ways to calculate them. So here I'm showing uh, these different methods. So the first method is called the Ross method. So the Ross method is pretty straightforward. Uh, it is defined as the um, basically 300 Fahrenheit, degree Fahrenheit higher than the autoignition temperature. And here we have a new concept, which is the autoignition temperature. So basically, if you mix the VOC with the oxygen and nitrogen, and let's say that it's under equilibrium after a long time, and at the same time, you, you're starting to ramp up the temperature in this system. So there's going to be a temperature where you basically hit to the value and then the VOC start to ignite, to combust, right? And because of that, um, this temperature here is called the auto-ignition temperature. So basically after this temperature, the VOC system is going to combust, right, automatically. So the Ross method uh, basically tells us the method to define this uh, or to find this optimal direct oxidation temperature, which is just 300 Fahrenheit higher than the auto-ignition temperature. So for example, if we will try to control the methane, right, the methane coming out of the uh, gas stream, and uh, we try to control this VOC, right, control this gas species through the direct thermal oxidation method. So based on the Ross method, we can first refer to this table 11.1, Right, this is auto ignition temperature of the selected organics in the air. You can see that the methane is here. It's based on the uh, alphabetic order. Okay, so the methane's uh, auto ignition temperature is 999 Fahrenheit. So basically, with the Roth method, we can find out that the uh, basically the recommended direct thermal oxidation temperature is going to be uh, 1299 degree Fahrenheit. So if we design a, auto, uh, design a thermal oxidation chamber or reactor to remove the VOC, we need to make sure that the temperature is maintained at this, uh, this value. So you can see that the Roth method is, is quite straightforward. So there's another method, which is called the Lee-Hansen method. So in this method, this uh, Hansen is actually uh, Professor Hansen at Stanford University. So he has done a lot of work uh, trying to look at the combustion physics combustion chemistry, and he designed the, the uh, basically the laser diagnostics method to try to look at what, it's, what is happening during the combustion process. So this Lee-Hansen method um, basically give you, give you two temperatures. 
So one temperature is the T99.9 .9, and the other temperature is T99. So what they mean is the recommended temperature or the uh, recommended direct thermal oxidation temperature for 99.9% .9 conversion of the VOC or 99% conversion of the VOC. Uh, so basically, if you can calculate T99.9 .9 and apply them into your uh, thermal oxidator for VOC incineration, then you can achieve 99.9% .9 conversion or oxidation of these VOC. And you can see that this calculation is uh, a little bit uh, sophisticated, right? There are a lot of parameters, this W1, W2, W3, until W11 here. So all of these parameters are actually dependent on the type of the VOC we're talking about, okay? So uh, let's think about uh, several scenarios. Let's say that we have a component let's say uh, um, alkane group, right? Hydrocarbon that is made of carbon, six carbon and 14 hydrogen. So basically you're going to have a, a saturated hydrocarbon, right? All of the bonds are connected to the hydrogen. And at the same time you have a benzene, okay? So if we do a comparison, which one is going to be more difficult to burn or which one is going to be more difficult to oxidize, right? It's going to be the benzene because, uh, because there is an aromatic ring here. So because of the aromatic ring, you're going to use a, you need to use a higher temperature for the benzene to react. Okay, and because of that, this will increase the T99.9 .9 or T99, and that is reflected by the term of the W2. Okay, so you can see that W2 here is defined at the aromatic compound flag. Zero means no, one means yes, right? If you have, um, basically, if we're talking about C6H4, which means that there's no aromatic ring, right? You need to set W2 to be e equal to zero. But if you have a benzene or the aromatic ring, you have to set this value to be one. Let's see what happens if we put one in here. If we put one in here, basically it means that you have to raise the temperature by 117. Uh, degree Fahrenheit to achieve the 99.9% conversion, right? Similarly for 99% conversion, you need to raise the temperature by 110 degree Fahrenheit. Basically it's representing that if you have an aromatic ring, you have a, a VOC that's difficult to burn, you have to raise the temperature for the thermal oxidation, right? So this is what's the meaning for these all of these uh, parameters. So it, as you can see, the aromatic, aromatic compound is going to determine the temperature here. And similarly, you can see that uh, for W3 here, this is the carbon-carbon double bond. We know that carbon-carbon double bond is going to be more stable, right? What it means is that um, it's going to be more difficult to, to burn the double bond. So that's why you also have this positive value here. Basically, if you have one uh, carbon carbon double bond, it means that you have to raise the um, oxidation temperature by 72, almost 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So similarly for nitrogen, if you have nitrogen in the, uh, in the VOC, you need to raise the temperature. If you have, uh, well, it's also dependent on the auto ignition temperature. The higher the auto ignition temperature, the higher the T99.9. Right, so we have to go back to this table here to find what is the auto ignition temperature of this VOC. So um, these are the basically the terms that will raise the temperature. And there's another term, W8. Right, W8 is the hydrogen to carbon ratio. So what it means is that if you have more uh, hydrogen. So the VOC is also going to be more difficult to burn. So what this method is representing is that if you have more carbon, actually, the uh, if you have more carbon, actually the the VOC is more uh, is actually easier to burn, right? And then you also have the W10, which is positive. This is carbon double bond chlorine interaction. So basically, if you have carbon and the chlorine inside. Um, the uh, the uh, oxidation is also difficult to conduct through. So these are the positive terms. Let's look at the negative terms, right? So this is negative, right? Basically, if you have a higher W1, 
it can actually lower this oxidation temperature, which means that it's easier to burn this VOC. So what does W1 represent? It is a number of the carbon atoms, right? <clears throat> so as I said, uh, with this leak Hansen method, it assumes that if we have more carbon, the, the VOC is actually easier to burn off. And uh, the W6, you can see that's also negative, right? This is number of oxygen atoms. This indeed makes sense, right? If you have an oxygen in this species, then it's easier to react because the oxygen itself can react with the hydrogen and carbon here. You don't need to provide a large amount of oxygen for them to for it to react by itself, right? And then you have the W7. This is number of sulfur. So the sulfur is quite similar to oxygen, right? They can react with the species. And also W9, this is a special compound uh, as well. This is uh, allylpropanol compound. Okay, so if you have one of that, then you can also lower the oxidation temperature. So you can see that uh, the T99.9 .9 is basically a complex function of all of these parameters. T99 is also a complex function of all of these parameters. But generally, T99 should be lower than T99.9 .9 because um, this one, you just need to achieve 99% uh, conversion, right? And this one needs a more complete conversion of all of the uh, BOCs. And this is indeed reflected in the values, right? You see the first constant here, the T99 uh, has 577, this is 594, that's lower, right? For all the positive terms, right? You see these coefficients are lower for T99, but for also for, the, for all of these negative values, right, that the values are smaller, which means that they're going to get reflected, right? And actually, they are larger for most of the terms, so, which means that they're getting reflected in the process of calculating T99, T99.9. Okay, so this is a brief introduction of this Lee Hansen method, and you can see that this is indeed more sophisticated, but for a lot of the VOCs, we don't have a lot of these complex compounds, right? And we can go through an example problem later on. So the third method is the Cooper Alley method, right? If you remember, Cooper Alley is actually the authors of our textbook. Um, so they calculated this recommended thermal oxidation temperature by calculating the uh, reaction rate constants. And we're not going to cover that in this class. So let's look at this example problem. Uh, is trying to let us estimate what is the temperature required in an isothermal uh, plug flow incinerator with a resonance time of 0.5 second to give 99.5% destruction of toluene, okay? So if you look at the um, chemical formula of toluene, you'll find that actually toluene is made of an aromatic ring, right? A benzene and attached by a CH3 group. So if you look at its chemical composition, it's actually made of C7H, what, H8, right? So this is its uh, chemical formula. So um, then um, it wants us to use these three methods. So here, we'll just focus on the first two methods. That's the Roth method, the Ross method and the Lee Hansen method, right? If you recall for the Roth method, it's just 300 Fahrenheit higher than the auto-ignition auto temperature. So we just need to look for the auto-ignition temperature of the toluene, right? It is right here. If it's 300 Fahrenheit higher, that's gonna be 1326 Fahrenheit, right? That's as simple as that. So what about the, uh, uh, what about the Lee Hansen method, right? We know that the chemical formula is like that, right? So we just need to plug in uh, all of these values to find out what is T99.9 .9 and T99. So let's take a look. For toluene, the number of carbon atoms is actually seven, right? Aromatic compound flag. It is yes, right? It has an aromatic compound. So W3, uh, double, double, uh, double, double, uh, I mean, the, the carbon covered double bond, right? There's no double bond. Right, because we already have a, a aromatic ring in there. So there's no nitrogen atoms, right? The autoignition temperature, as we saw earlier, that's 1026.
number of oxygen atoms, that's going to be zero. Sulfur atoms, that's zero. Hydrogen to carbon ratio, that's going to be eight divided by seven. The uh, two propanol compound, that's zero. Uh, the carbon chlorine interaction, that's zero. And the natural log. So eventually, we also have a natural log of the resonance time. This is one thing that we forgot to mention. Okay, so the resonance time is also going to determine the, um, the oxidation temperature. Let's think, um, if we have a higher, a larger resonance time, it means that we have a longer time for this VOC to react, right? So theoretically, if you have a longer time, then that could reduce the recommended temperature. You can just burn these VOC efficiently at a longer resonance time. But if the resonance time is very short, then it means that we have to increase this temperature. So that's why you're going to have a negative value here, right? And um, so you see that W11, that's gonna be natural log of the resonance time, which means that it's going to be natural log of 0.3. So these are all the W1 through W11, right? We can just easily plug it in to find what is the value for T99.9 T, uh, T99, and T99. And you can see that this is actually the equation. So you can find that these two temperatures are 1386 Fahrenheit and 30, uh, 1369 Fahrenheit. And this problem is asking for 99.5 destruction of the tolerance. So we could just do a linear interpolation where we know the temperature uh, for 99% uh, of destruction. And we also know the temperature for 99.9. .9. So we could just assume that this is a linear relationship and then find out uh, find out what's the temperature for 99.5, okay? And the final answer is 1378. So you can see that these two temperatures actually are not really far away from each other, okay? But for accuracy, right? Uh, I think people still would recommend the uh, Lee Hansen method for calculating this uh, thermal oxidation temperature, okay? So one thing we need to pay attention is that um, for this uh, direct thermal oxidation, this is a process that does not, does not involve catalyst, right? So theoretically, if we have catalyst in the VOC incinerator, then this temperature should be lower because the catalyst can lower the activation energy for the reaction, right? So this is about the VOC incineration. And as we said, um, in this class, we're just going to talk about the three uh, VOC control methods, the uh, VOC condensation, incineration, and this is the last one. This is the gas absorption. So uh, as we know from our earlier classes, we know that the gas absorption basically means the removal of the uh, gases or vapors by attaching through the attach attachment of these vapor molecules onto a solid, right? And a common example that we give is the activated carbon. So here I have a short video about how we can use these active carbon, actually uh, how effective they are. So the most important property of active carbon is actually surface area. That larger the surface area, more area for the
and you can see that even iodine is like a sort of molecule in the water. Water is purified. This is the demonstration on the methane, which is a tie in the water. Also, remove them by adding the carbon. This is a methane too. We're adding activated carbon. See a lot of uh, bubbles can form. Let's talk about why it form a lot of bubbles. Methane in blue dies, so let it work by the active So we have a large this is um, going to explain why we're getting bubbles. Right? The easy way to distinguish the typical charcoal and the active carbon is just to see whether they form bubbles inside. Form bubbles because added carbon itself, before it's dissolving into water, it's thrown into the water, already has a very large surface area. Oxygen and nitrogen, those air molecules are getting attached on the surface. Once they're in the water, those air try to escape, but have a smaller density, and so it can be covered. So, uh, regarding the uh, absorption, actually, there are two types of absorption. Uh, systems. So one is called the physical absorption. I would say that activated carbon most of the times is using physical absorption, which means that there's just the attachment of the uh, vapor or the, uh, the molecules onto the surface of the active carbon. And there's also chemical absorption, or sometimes people also call them uh, chemisorption, which means that these molecules, once they attach onto the surface of the solid, they can actually react. For example, we could use the uh, soda or soda powder to absorb some acidic gases like sulfur dioxide. So once they get attached onto the surface of the soda, because the sulfur dioxide is acidic gas, the soda is base, right? They can, um, they can get in contact with each other and further go through reaction, all right? Um, so the active carbon is actually a wide, widely used uh, uh, absorbent, and um, people use that for the industrial scale VOC control. And actually, um, during the uh, 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster, um, a lot of researchers actually thought about using the active carbon to go through or to, to purify, actually, to do the nuclear cleanup. Uh, to purify the water and the uh, air in there because the active carbon has a large surface area. It can uh, um, basically absorb the, um, the radioactive materials either in the gas phase or in the liquid phase. Um, so in terms of the industrial applications of the gas absorption, people typically use that for uh, use gas absorption uh, for the uh, odor control, right? So for example, for some chemical plants, they, if they form some acidic gases, or, or let's say um, the gases, or even for the wastewater treatment plant, or the cycling, or the, the, the garbage treatment, right? The solid waste uh, treatment plant, if they generate a lot of odor, they could use the active carbon to deal with, the, um, uh, deal with this, those odors. And uh, actually for indoor air purification, um, when people try to control the, uh, the uh, ozone that are generated indoor, 
people will also use these active carbon or black carbon filters to basically to absorb uh, these uh, these odors. All right. So here I have a, a question that may be related to our daily life, right? So if you search online, right? So what do we normally use to remove the odor in the fridge? Right? This is kind of similar to the industrial uh, odor control too, right? Um, so if you check online, you can actually see that um, people could, of course, use the aggregate carbon. Right? I'll just write AC here, right? So people actually could also use the grounded coffee bean. Okay, so the grounded coffee beans are kinds of similar to the active carbon because after they're grounded, they have a larger surface area, right? And coffee bean itself can generate some pleasant smells. So we can use that to absorb those, those odor in the fridge and also to, to release those uh, pleasant uh, odor, right? We could also use the oatmeal. So the oatmeal is basically the similar mechanism, right? It can act as, as an absorbent to remove the, the VOCs. And we could also use a baking soda. So as I said, the baking soda is a base, right? It can react with the acidic gases in the, uh, in the fridge, right? Uh, typically we know that the odor inside the fridge can be sulfur dioxide and then also can be uh, hydrogen sulfide right? Uh, if um, things get rotten, right? The hydrogen sulfide um, is, is the thing that gives you the unpleasant smell there. The hydrogen sulfide is acidic gas, right? It can further react with the baking soda. So I would say that the baking soda is using the chemisorption or the chemical absorption. Well, the active carbon, the grounded co coffee bean and the oatmeal are using the physical absorption. So people also use the uh, gas absorption to recover the VOCs. So sometimes let's say the VOC itself is so precious, right? Maybe in the process of the petroleum or the in the refinery, we want to collect the VOCs um, that's in the gas stream. We could use the gas absorption to get them attached down to the active carbon and we could further um, regenerate the active carbon and then release the, um, the VOC out of it, right? And then uh, we could also use the, um, the, um, the uh, let's say the gas absorption to dry the processed gas streams, right? Uh, this is more about the removal of the water vapor from the gas stream, right? So if we have active carbon there, and then the water vapor can get attached on the surface of the active carbon so that we can dry this process gas stream. Um, so then it's about the process design, right? How do we design these ga gas absorption systems or gas absorbers? Um, so as we introduced, right, the active carbon, if we use that for gas absorption, then it's going to um, I mean, involve a process called regeneration. because we know that the agri-carbon has limited surface area, right? So once its surface area is all occupied by these VOC molecules, basically we cannot absorb the VOC anymore. So we have to basically clean the active carbon, right? To release those VOC and so that we can recycle the agricarbon carbon back into the absorber uh, to remove the VOC, okay? So, um, we need to consider the question, right? So uh, can we operate it for an infinitely long time? No, because there's limited surface area of the active carbon, limited um, basically size for us to attach those VOC molecules onto the active carbon. And because of that, um, uh, or because of this regeneration process, when we design the absorber systems, we always need to design a, spire, uh, a spare uh, absorber. So what that means is, Let's say if we have two uh, absorbers, right? So the, let's say we can introduce the VOC or the flue gas from the bottom and then they're coming out, right? And this is, um, let's say the active carbon inside the uh, reactor, right? The absorber. Um, so what it means is that after a while 
of the operation of the active carbon. So the, um, the VOC concentration or the VOC may already occupy most of the area, or a large area of the uh, active carbon. And in that case, we have to shut this off so that we can regenerate the active carbon in this bed here. While the remaining uh, gas stream or the rest of the gas stream can go through the other, go through the other absorber, right? And if this one needs to get regenerated, we just cut it off and then let the gas streams to go through this one. Uh, so I would say that this idea is very similar to um, PM control device, right? Can you tell me which one is it? So we talk about the cyclones, the, the ESP, the backhouse filters. Which one is similar to the idea of the absorber? That's the backhouse filters, right? The backhouse filters also need the, uh, I would say the cleaning time, which is similar to this regeneration process, right? So um, basically from this, um, from this regeneration process, we can um, make sure that the, uh, the active carbon is clean. It can be used for further um, absorbing processes. And then uh, you may wonder, well, how does the regeneration process work, right? So here I have a schematic diagram. And this is also the figure 12.1 from your textbook. So basically we can have the, uh, the air solvent mixture, which is a flue gas, right? We can send it through some blowers and then send it through these absorbers. Okay, so here, as you can see, we have two absorbers here. Theoretically, when both of them are working, we can directly vent the uh, exhaust gas, right? The VOCs are getting captured. But sometimes, let's say, if one of them is getting saturated, and they will have to use this valve here to take it offline so that the rest of the, um, the flue gas can go through here, right? And then at the same time, when we try to regenerate it, we're going to send in the steam or high temperature steam. I'm going to introduce why we have to do that later on. So basically by introducing the steam, we can let the steam gas stream to carry the VOC away. And then we can create or we can regenerate these active carbon so that VOC is off the surface. So why do we need to use the steam? Or why do we, basically, why do we need to use a high temperature environment to release these VOCs? So actually, if you see this uh, entire uh, complete process here, uh, you can see that the steam is going to carry the VOC away, right? And then uh, after in here, um, we can have a condenser to remove the VOCs, right? Because temperature is still high, so the VOC can condense, this is the, the process that we're quite familiar with, right? And then uh, we can go through the decanter. This is basically to remove the water vapor and uh, we can get the organics, the VOCs, right? So we can concentrate them. And the water stream here will just go to the waste, uh, the, the waste, right? This is a process of taking one of the sorbents. So if this one needs to regenerate, we just put this offline and then the rest uh, I mean, to, to open this valve here so that gas stream can go through this uh, cleaner absorber, all right? So now let's get back to the question, why do we have to use the steam? Um, so basically the, the absorption process is a process that's released heat. So um, but if you consider the, the active carbon, right? And then you have a lot of vapor molecules moving around. So they carry their kinetic energy, right? They can move anywhere they want. But once they get attached onto the surface of the active carbon, so their extra kinetic energy is being transferred into the active carbon, right? So where does the actual energy go? The actual energy is just going to change into the state of the internal energy, which is the temperature. So basically um, the absorption process because of the energy transfer is going to be an exothermic uh, process, which means that it's going to release heat, right? And um, because this process is in equilibrium, right? If it releases heat, then what it means is that in order to maximize the absorption, what should we do? Should we use a higher temperature or lower temperature? Basically, should we create a cooler environment or hotter environment? We need to use a cooler environment, right? If you have a cooler environment, 
and this process is uh, exothermic, right? So it's pushing or it's dragging this process to take place. But if you want to regenerate it, if you want to regenerate the actual carbon, basically you want to convert all of these VOC back into the get into the gas phase, what do you do? You just increase the temperature. So that's why we need to use high temperature steam to push these, basically to push these VOCs from the surface of the active carbon so that we can regenerate it. And as I said, um, when we design these um, absorbers, we have to have at least two beds, right? Generally we have two beds. So one is called the idle bed, the other is called the running bed, okay? So uh, in terms of the regeneration process, we're going to use, uh, typically we're going to use a lower pressure and a higher temperature. Okay, and this is the process when we introduce a steam into the, uh, into the absorber. So here I have another video, this, which is talking about the uh, absorbing process. Okay, so let me share the screen. So this is basically the absorb, um, absorber bed, right? And um, uh, this is basically where the uh, absorption takes place. And when you try to regenerate, the uh, active carbon, you're basically going to give it a, a higher temperature, right? A higher temperature is going, to, uh, is going to release the VOC and the VOC can get transferred uh, onto the top, right? So basically the condenser is going to condense the VOCs and then concentrate the VOC stream. And this is, uh, we could also operate it uh, in, the alternative, uh, in the alternating mode, right? So one of them is regenerating, and the other uh, is absorbing. So in this way, uh, we could achieve the continuous running of the absorber. All right, and then we could have the absorption and desorption process. Okay, so this is a short video and uh, we could get back to our class. All right, um, so then we probably need to talk about a few terminologies. Um, so regarding the absorption process, um, there are terms called the adsorbent. So adsorbent are just the active carbon that we mentioned, right? And there's also adsorbate. The adsorbate is the, um, is the, the species that we're trying to absorb. Those can be the VOCs or, or the water vapors. Right, and um, there's also a term called the capacity of the adsorbent. So the capacity of, of the adsorbent, basically it means the quantity, quantity of VOC adsorbed per unit mass of the adsorbent. Let's say that we just put active carbon in here. So the capacity of the adsorbent just, just means the, the quantity of the VOC that is uh, adsorbed per unit mass of the active carbon or the adsorbent, right? And there's also the terminology called the isotherms. So the isotherms, what that means is just plotting the capacity of the adsorbent against the VOC partial pressure. So we talked about this curve uh, a little bit earlier, right? Two classes ago. We said that the uh, amount of the VOC that can be adsorbed, if we plot it as a function of partial pressure, is going to follow this line here, right? And this, uh, this is a VOC, VOC adsorbed. Right, so 
so we said that this is because the absorbent or the active carbon has limited area of the uh, limited quantity of the surface area. It cannot achieve an infinite uh, absorption of the VOC species. But why is it, right? Can we use some mathematical equations to, to show this, right? So here we can do a quick derivation. So we're getting to the end of the class and uh, let's carry this over. So basically, as we said, the absorption process uh, can be assumed to be a equilibrium process, right? Can be. Uh, so if we talk about the equilibrium, then there's going to be a, a forward reaction or forward process and backward process. So for the forward process, we can consider that as the absorption. And for the backward process, we can consider that as a desorption. Okay, so we can have these forward and backward processes. So now if it's in equilibrium, then we have to consider what are the rates for the absorption and desorption, right? So we can write out what is the absorption rate. So the absorption rate is going to be proportional to the partial pressure. Right, so the higher the partial pressure of the VOC molecules, the higher the rate for the absorption. But it is also dependent on what are the surface area that are still available for absorption, right? If all the areas are covered by the VOC already, right, it's not going to be able to absorb any VOCs anymore. So to show that, we can use the term of one minus F. So the F here, is basically the fraction of the area that's covered by the VOC. Okay. And also um, it is not going to be exactly the, this term here. So that's why we are going to multiply a uh, coefficient, which is called CA, right? We could also calculate what is the desorption rate. So the desorption rate is just going to be something proportional to, to F, right? So the higher the area that's covered by the VOC, right, the higher the desorption rate, and we can multiply that by a coefficient of CB. So under equilibrium condition, the RA is equal to RD, so basically it means that CA PI one minus F is going to be CB multiplied by F. And we can actually calculate what is F, right? So the F is just going to be what? CA PI divided by, uh, divide by CA PI plus CB, okay? Does that make sense, All right? So then we can make a, um, a process, let's say make a, a calculation that we divide the term CB on both the numerator and denominator of this uh, fraction here. So basically we have CA divided by CB multiplied by PI and then CA divided by CB, PI plus one. Okay, so we divide the CB terms on both the numerator and denominator. So we can further define this CA divided by CB term as, P, uh, as K, right? We have K PI divided by K PI plus one. So now let's consider two extremes. So we're trying to plot the isotherms, right? We said that isotherm is um, basically the VOC absorbed uh, as a function of the PI, right? So the F here is the area that's covered by the VOC, right? So we know that the isotherm or the capacity 
the VOC absorption capacity is going to be proportional. Let's say the capacity is going to be proportional to this F here. Right? The higher the F, the higher the capacity, right? Because F is the area, fraction of the area covered by the VOC. That's why the higher, if you can achieve a 100% area covered, right? Then the capacity will be, be the maximum. Okay, so now let's consider two extremes. Let's say, let's see what's gonna happen if PI is much, much smaller than one. So if PI is much, much smaller than one, the KPI is also going to be much, much smaller than one, right? So what that means is that in the denominator, we can just ignore this term, right? So we, we're going to have F equal to just K multiplied by PI, right? And then what happens if the PI much larger than one? If it's much larger than one, and then KPI is going to be much larger than one, we can just ignore this one term here, and we're going to have one, okay? So basically it's telling us that the maximum area that can be covered by the VOC is just going to be 100%, right? So now let's look at these two extremes. So when the PI, it's much, much smaller than one, which means that it's close to zero. This increase here is going to be linear. And when the PI is much, much larger than one, it's going to be a constant, which is one. So what's gonna happen in the middle? It's gonna be a curve, right? Gradually increase to one. So this is why uh, we, we showed earlier that the VOC capacity, let's say the capacity, It's going to give you a curved shape that looks like this, right? It's just going to increase almost linearly in the beginning, and then it's going to reach maximum value at the end, right? And as we said, for VOCs of uh, for the absorbance at different temperatures, they may follow different uh, curves here, and also for different VOC species, they're going to show different curves, right? So this is going to be a very complicated uh, isotherm, even for the same active carbon species. So that's why people look at all of these isotherms and they realize that there are actually some patterns that we could follow. So what is the um, pattern, right? So what they found is that if you just look at the uh, active carbon and this absorbing species of similar chemical formula, right? Methane, ethane, propane. So all of these are hydrocarbons, right? You could also have methyl sulfide or disulfide. These are basically having VOCs, uh, including sulfur inside, right? And what we could, we could see is that if we plot the capacity of the active carbon as a function of this term here. So this term is a complex function of temperature, right? The, um, the vapor pressure, basically this is saturation vapor pressure and the partial pressure of this species, right? And all of them are going to collapse onto the same line. Okay, so what does that mean? So when we show the uh, isotherms, when we have a relatively lower partial pressure, we're going to have a very low capacity, right? So this is showing, if we show that in here, basically it means that the partial pressure is low. You're going to have a larger term of the log term, right? You're trying to look at, basically you're looking at some values in here and that's why you have a low capacity in here. But when you look at high um, partial pressure and we know that the partial pressure cannot be higher than the vapor pressure, right? So what that means is that the maximum value we can take for the partial pressure is just the PV and that's going to give you the log of one, which is the maximum or the highest vapor, uh, highest partial pressure. So that's going to give you the maximum uh, um, capacity. And people found that actually by plotting different species with similar uh, chemical formula, right? And, and by plotting them under different temperature in this curve here, the, all of them are going to collapse onto a, a similar line here. And this is uh, for the species that has sulfur inside. And this is also showing you the hydro hydrocarbon as dashed line. So you can see that particles or VOCs of different chemical species, chemical formulas, they're going to have different types of the isotherms, right? So I think we can probably finish the discussion in here. And uh, one thing 
that we didn't cover is the method for measuring it, right? So um, as we said, the, um, the isotherms are measured under equilibrium, right? Equilibrium take a very long time to achieve. So that's why people have the aesthetic method or the dynamic method to, to measure them. And as we said, in order to plot them, we can plot them for the similar, uh, for species with similar chemical formula so that all of them can collapse onto a similar line here. Okay, so uh, that's it for this class. And um, um, I think we covered quite many things in this class and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.